Well, I am going to move back into Zizek's The Year of Dreaming Dangerously. I took a break from that because I wanted to talk about Michael Oakeshott. And I might go back to Oakeshott later, too, but I feel the uh, urge to uh, get back into that book. And I had not covered the chapter Zizek wrote, which is entitled Welcome to the Desert of Post-Ideology. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and just draw out a few interesting um, concepts that he brings forward there. The first thing that leaps out in this chapter is the distinction that Zizek makes with the help of psychologist Jacques Lacan's scholarship between pleasure and enjoyment. Those two words for many of us mean about the same thing, but in the way that Lacan used them, they signified two very different experiences. In a nutshell, pleasure is tame, whereas enjoyment or jouissance is excessive and uncontrollable in a way. He says what Lacan calls enjoyment is a deadly excess rather than pleasure. And there we have Lacan actually smoking something that looks like a crooked blunt, but I'm not sure. It's probably just a cigar, but it is a really, really unusual cigar. <laughs> so um, I thought that was a, a very fitting image for this particular thought. Now let me talk a little bit about this idea of pleasure first. Um, he uses the term the university to describe this concept as well. And that's a pretty direct reference to um, the fact that in our day and age, almost everything has been studied to death. And we have, you know, thousands of experts working on every conceivable aspect of our lives, covering everything and making and trying to make everything safe or inaccessible, right? Um, I have a contract up here, one of the many that you'll find on the internet for safe sex where everything is, um, you know, agreed upon in advance, uh, right down to initialing every single um, item there. Um, so the university represents a concept such as safe sex, safe smoking, which would be vaping or maybe getting a nicotine patch so that you can quit eventually calorie-free sugar, low-calorie hedonistic items like ice cream, things that he doesn't include in the chapter here, but, you know, tons of healthy advice in your news shows, in your magazines, and whatever, and telling you how that you can enjoy certain things in moderation, or if you combine this with exercise, and of course also um, the ethical product so that we can enjoy the things that we buy without any sort of sense of guilt. We'll be doing it responsibly because at the same time that we buy this item, we are also helping the planet or helping disadvantaged people. Uh, later in the chapter, I found this, uh, this little snippet here that kind of gives you an idea of, of Zizek's notion of safe sex. He says, after a woman and I agree to have sex, each of us need only designate a younger stand-in so that while they make love, or more precisely while the two of us make love through them, we can have a quiet drink and conversation and then retire to our own quarters to rest. I guess that's the ultimate safe sex. Sort of virtual, let somebody else take the minuscule risk. Okay, well, it, I mean, it's funny, but it also describes the level of detachment that he thinks people um, live in from their own experiences or from experiences that they could have. And then jouissance or enjoyment, he also um, identifies, just as he identifies pleasure with the university, he identifies through Lacan jouissance with the master. Um, and that takes a little bit of untangling to figure out exactly what he's talking about there. Jouissance is not consumeristic hedonism. He says the basic function of enlightened consumeristic hedonism is to deprive enjoyment of its excessive dimension, of its disturbing surplus, of the fact that it serves nothing. So that gives us an indication of what jouissance or enjoyment is about. It, it's something that's excessive, that's surplus, and that serves nothing. It has no other um, purpose 
other than the enjoyment itself. And you can see already, think about how that uh, that notion and that experience runs counter to the basic logic of capitalism because capitalism is about selling things and you can't continue to sell something if a person really doesn't have an objective, really doesn't care about tomorrow. Um, and you know, you can sell something to them only if you can continue to, right? Um, but, but he characterizes that kind of um, pleasure as empty because you never are satisfied. They're never, they're, you never reach a bottom. Whereas he says the joisseur, the um, person who enjoys, is ready to consummate his very existence in the deadly excess of enjoyment. And one example he gives of this, which is we have to be careful about this because um, to understand it correctly is very important, um, but he uses the example of, the, he says, the notion of homosexuality as involving an ethics of now, of unconditional fidelity to jouissance, of following the death drive by totally ignoring any reference to the future or engagement with the practical complex of worldly affairs. Well, I think what he's getting that uh, at there, and he's coming through probably Freud as well as Lacan, is this idea ultimately, fundamentally, homosexuality is a sexual activity that is non-productive in the sense of producing children and therefore is more turned towards the actual experience of sexuality itself for what it is at this at any given moment. I guess to the extent that uh, gay people try to kind of become more like straight people, um, there might be less of this aspect within within their lives. Um, for instance, in, in gay marriage, in adoption, and such things as that. I, it'd be kind of curious to, think, to see what Zizek thinks of those developments. Then he takes a twist though and he deepens the concept of what the master means. The master, I've, I've read a little bit about Lacan and it could be, but I'm not sure, the master may represent the big other because the big other in Lacan's language seems to be this thing that is sort of like the social mind or the hive mind, um, the source of social control that uh, is al already kind of embedded in people's minds as a self-reinforcing mechanism. But at any rate, he says here that the master, um, it, it doesn't enjoy himself. Instead, he keeps a close eye on everything and he leaves to his servants the only real enjoyments and those are little things like, um, when he turns a blind eye to their stealing uh, food or liquor from him or when he doesn't pay attention while they have sex in his house or whatever it may be. Um, the Of our day, such things would be, you know, when we see people con uh, continuing to insist on smoking even though the entire world seems to be totally dead set against it at this point, and they have to go to rather extremes in spending money as well as in finding a place to smoke these days, or hedonistic drug and alcohol use in which people don't, you know, uh, get a designated driver, get behind the wheel, I don't know, um, take too much, risk their lives. Um, and of course, unsafe and, and extreme sex. Unsafe doesn't mean just, I think it doesn't mean for Zizek just not using a condom, but having sex that isn't well planned, well thought out, isn't necessarily about a lasting contractual relationship and all of that um, is unsafe. So he's saying here that the people who squeak through the cracks at least part of the time to continue to do these things, they are enjoying. And in doing that, they are, I think, confronting life more directly or they're feeling their life. Their life is not mediated by the master or the big other for those moments and for those times. But if I've got this right, the master in our day and age has an interest in keeping these things 
on the outskirts and on the minimum, allowing just enough so that people don't blow, but not so much as to upset the apple cart of the system because it relies upon people continuing to live and continuing to live rather healthily and coming back and buying again. Um, although our epidemic of obesity kind of belies, I mean, they, I guess we haven't found a good solution to that problem. Oh, except maybe in the medical profession to the extent that we can keep people alive despite all of their worst efforts to, um, to ruin their health with the junk food and stuff that's sold to them. So there is that, our insurance industry. So I think in an, another term that Lacan uses and that Zizek uses is the real, which I'm still trying to grapple with, but I, I do think it has something to do with just the confrontation with actual real life, which is oftentimes raw, scary, blind, dangerous, pointless, or at least seemingly so. So he says that the master controls access to the real. Well, he doesn't exactly say that, but that's kind of what I'm reading, is that the master, the social control, is about you know minimizing and regulating access to the real. And these enjoyments are little glimpses at the real. Um, he says for Lacan, the only enjoyments are the little bits left to the servant by the master when he turns a blind eye to the servant's little transgressions. Jouissance comes easy to the slave. And he says the master or father is the social control that regulates pleasure and limits enjoyment. But, and there's a big um, but at the end of this, um, at the end of this uh, chapter, not literally but figuratively, Sometimes that control breaks down and the real comes out in an aggressive way. Um, and so he goes into this, this uh, segue into the, the neighbor, the harassing neighbor, the other person who's out there who seems to want to upset things that's troublesome. And we don't want to see too much of them because it feels like harassment. They insist on living senseless and self-destructive lives, or so it seems to the people looking at them from the other side. And Zizek delves into the reason why this neighbor is so problematic. Of course, he's problematic to the extent that he indulges in some of these enjoyments, which seem to the rest of us to be unhealthy and unsustainable and contrary to common sense. and and our values and, and such things as that. But also the neighbor is particularly troublesome. And I like the fact that he uses the, the term the neighbor and he brings in the Judeo-Christian um, connotation of the neighbor. Uh, the neighbor is the one that we ought to um, have relations with, that we ought to treat well, that we ought to respect and regard. But we have a hard time doing that because the neighbor is such a troublemaker and it's hard to love the neighbor, okay? So he brings all that in. Um, but the neighbor, you know, uh, goes along enjoying, in, you know, grabbing the little crumbs of enjoyment, like the servant, but sometimes those crumbs aren't even, even available or not available enough, and the capitalist system is not allowing enough income of, and security, in other words, for the neighbor to be able to have his little share, and that's when the neighbor strikes back. One of the objectives of this chapter is to explain riots like the UK riots of 2011, um, or any riots where you see more mayhem and frenzy than you see any sort of um, demand or program for change being put forth. He says, the more a society conforms to a well-organized rational state, the more abstract negativity of irrational violence returns. So part of this violence is a pushback against the biopolitical um, management of people's lives that kind of comes under the category of university or pleasure only. 
part of it is a rebellion against that. And then another part is the fact that the little safety valves at certain times seem to be very scarce. So he says, more than anything else, the riots were consumerist carnival of destruction, an expression of acquisitive desire violently enacted when unable to realize itself in the proper way by shopping. So again, two things, right? Push back against overmanaged life and a lack of access to enjoyment or more fundamentally the real and lack of access to the safety valves of consumption. So we're talking about people who either have very little income or they have income but not enough to obtain the satisfaction that they need. He says the sad fact that opposition to the system cannot articulate itself in the guise of a realistic alternative or at least a coherent utopian project, but only takes the form of meaningless outbursts, is a grave indictment of our epic, and it's caused by, in his view, of course, capitalism. Those two conditions are caused by um, advanced capitalism. And then finally, he goes into the special problem with capitalism that it's worldless, he says. Capitalism, he says, can fit any culture and political order. So Francis Fukuyama, for instance, was wrong when he thought that capitalism would ultimately always promote a certain kind of idealized liberal democratic people with higher education, etc. Actually, he, he's arguing what we see around the world is that capitalism, you know, corporate globalized capitalism adapts itself to every, any and every culture. Um, and tries to gain cheap labor, tries to sell stuff, um, so it, it doesn't produce this one ideal system. It ultimately then has no grand narrative. There's nothing for people to latch on to, which would be another safety valve. If people have some, some grand narrative, some true meaning, meaning some conviction, um, that they can hold on to. But capitalism, he argues, produces convictionless people whose identity is wrapped up in what they can buy. He leaves us with this thought that this is why, as an alternative, some people will be drawn to religious fundamentalisms, broadly speaking, whether that's actual religious fundamentalism like right-wing Christianity or Islamic fundamentalism, or it's a sort of religious ideological alternative of some kind that's not as openly theistically religious. Um, okay, well I've gone over a bit, but I hope this has been informative. See you next time. Bye.